You're traveling through the unknown, a journey beyond the corners of reality, where the shadows whisper and the chill runs deep. Welcome to the dimension where your deepest fears are given form. This is the Midnight Mystery. For seven days straight, an eerie blood-red bus would stop in front of my house at 3.33 a.m. This seemed strange, mostly because, like the vast majority of American towns, Frost Hollow had no public transportation at all. Even stranger, people always got on and off the bus whenever it stopped. They all looked extremely tall and thin, and whenever I tried to focus on their faces, they seemed like no more than a flesh-colored blur. On the morning of the seventh day, I had called the sheriff's department to ask them about it. I had no better ideas. A woman with a thick southern accent answered the phone. Morning, sheriff's office. How can I help you? She drawled. I hesitated, not even knowing where to start with this odd story. I'm not really sure who to call about this, but there's a bus stopping in front of my house in the middle of the night, dropping people off. I live on Slaughterhouse Road, past the abandoned school. It's... A little strange because it only comes past three in the morning and there are always people waiting to board it. I rambled, sweating heavily. I felt like a fool. The woman went silent for a long moment. I could hear her slight breathing on the other end of the line. We don't have any buses going to Slaughterhouse Road, sir, she said insistently. There are no buses in the town at all other than for the public schools. At least not public transportation. Perhaps it's a private company? Did you see any company logo or information on the side of the bus? Any route numbers or anything? Sometimes the nursing homes or medical facilities might have private buses for elderly or disabled patients. I had been trying to avoid this subject, but now I had no choice but to reveal what I saw. Yes. On the side of the bus, it said Inferno Express, and the route number said 666. I heard only breathing on the other end of the line for a couple seconds as if the woman were waiting for the punchline. A heartbeat later, I heard her hang up on me. I stood there listening to the whine of the dial tone, thinking and wondering. I knew I needed evidence of the mysterious night bus, and I felt determined to get it. At 3 a.m., I put on a black, long-sleeved shirt, black sneakers, and black jeans, trying to make myself as inconspicuous as possible. Nervously, I grabbed my digital camera and headed outside. The night felt beautiful warm and humid with a soft breeze. I smelled the fresh summer air sweeping down the rolling hills, trying to calm myself down. I felt as if I were going out to commit a murder, rather than just trying to capture video of a random bus in my own backyard. I crept across the road, seeing the windows in my neighbor's house stood dark. The street I lived on consisted mostly of woodlands with a few scattered houses. There were plenty of good hiding spots. I knew the bus stopped in front of a patch of marshy swampland a few hundred feet down the road, right on the border of my neighbor's property. I found some large, thick bushes near the street to hide behind, making sure I was far enough away to avoid being detected while still maintaining a clear line of sight. I checked my watch, seeing the minute hand creeping toward the penultimate moment. This was my last chance to leave. I felt a rising anxiety and uncertainty, sweating heavily. I closed my eyes, waiting and listening. It seemed only seconds later that I heard the approaching rumble of a powerful engine echoing far down the road. I went into action immediately, pressing the record button. I turned the camera on myself, whispering furtively. Hello, my name is Landon Piers, I murmured quickly, trying to get it all out before the bus got here. I live in Frost Hollow on Slaughterhouse Road. For the past week, a bus has been stopping in front of my house in the middle of the night, and the people on it, they don't look right. They're all extremely tall and thin, so I'm here, recording all of this. If something happens to me, if someone finds this… I let the sentence fade off into nothing. The brakes of the bus squealed with a hellish caterwauling. I smelled exhaust and gasoline. A heartbeat later the bus came into view stopping only a stone's throw away from where I crouched, hiding in the thick shadows of the swampy brush. Mosquitoes constantly buzzed past my ears, landing on my neck and arms every few seconds, but I dared not move. 
I kept the camera steady, trying to quiet my breathing. I felt paranoid and watched, as if the people on the bus knew exactly where I was and what I was up to. The bus gleamed with fresh blood-red paint. The windows looked like sideways eyeballs, long dark oval panes whose shadows contrasted heavily with the bright exterior. I checked to make sure the camera was recording, satisfied to see the small red indicator light glowing brightly. I hoped that the people on the bus wouldn't see the slight glare of the screen or the red dot of the camera, if indeed they were people at all. The door at the front slid open with a shrieking of rusty metal. An interior light turned on inside the bus, glowing with a fiery radiance. All of the strange, eye-shaped windows shone with the bright scarlet illumination. It danced and strobed, sending long shadows skittering down the swamp. At the front, I saw a driver in a black suit with white buttons and high, polished boots, almost reminding me of the garb of an SS officer. He looked extremely tall, his bone-white head extending nearly to the ceiling. Two lidless black eyes bulged from his head, like the eyes of some monstrous praying mantis. They looked nearly the size of oranges. I gasped as he turned to look in my direction. I wondered if those enormous eyes could see the tiny red dot on my camera. To my horror, my question was answered moments later. Tall, faceless silhouettes stepped off the bus, appearing suddenly in the crimson light. I looked through the screen of the camera, zooming in to try to see any signs of eyes or mouths or noses. Yet the recording showed everything clearly enough. The smooth, featureless flesh stretching across their egg-shaped heads. Their arms stretched down nearly to their feet, their fingers long and twisted like the gnarled roots of a tree. Around their bodies, I saw orange jumpsuits, like those prisoners in the area wore. Their smooth, hairless skin rippled slightly, moving in and out as if these strange creatures breathed through it. A few of these bizarre creatures entered the woods and swamps, diverging in different directions. One of them went towards a neighbor's house, creeping around the side with exaggerated eerie steps. It glanced in the windows with its eyeless face, putting its long fingers around the sides of its head as if it were trying to block out the glare of non-existent sunlight. It was as if these abominations had only heard about human mannerisms through word of mouth. It tiptoed forward on dull black shoes that seemed twice as long as any normal human foot. The bus stayed unmoving in front of me, its engine idling loudly, the door hanging open. I saw the driver pushing himself up off his massive chair. He slunk forwards, bowing his smooth, hairless head as he exited the threshold. Like the faceless creatures, he tiptoed forwards in an exaggerated, almost childlike manner, his bulging black eyes glittering. He looked completely insane. He kept his arms raised, drawing the claw-like hands back and forth with every overemphasized step. I realized with mounting horror that he appeared headed in my direction. A few moments later, I was certain of it. His head ratcheted up to face me, his protuberant eyes appearing more excited and manic than before. My heart hammered in my chest as I looked around for a way out. The hairless, chalk-white face grinned with a psychotic gleam as the driver quickly pushed his way through the thick bushes at the border of the road, his gaze never faltering, his eyes never leaving mine. At that moment, a fear like I had never experienced before shot through my body. I stumbled to my feet, turning to sprint blindly into the forest. But behind me lay a fetid swamp. As soon as I took a single step, my foot sunk deeply into the earth. Brown water flooded over the moss covering the ground in a superficial layer as it collapsed under my weight. Shit, I swore, my arms windmilling as I nearly fell forward into the rank water. But a hand shot out, grabbing me by the back of the neck and yanking me back. The hand felt burning hot, as if the flesh of the owner had an extreme case of fever. My digital camera slipped out of my hands, falling into the swampy ground with a wet thud. Get off me! I screamed, trying to grab at the hand holding my neck with an iron grasp. I was still facing away from the bus, but I felt myself being pulled backwards. Stumbling, I tried not to fall. My foot caught on sharp rocks and roots, but the sharp fingers of the hand never loosened. It would just pull me back up to my feet, the fingers digging into my flesh with an agonizing pain. 
I felt small trickles of blood running down my back and the sides of my neck. As we got back to the pavement, the driver threw me down hard in front of the bus steps. I felt skin tear along my knees and elbows, sensed the many cuts and bruises I had suffered. I raised my head, slowly blinking my eyes. Blearily, I looked up through the open door, seeing the enormous driver's seat sitting empty. It took me a few moments to realize what else I was seeing, but when I did, a sense of horror like a lightning strike smashed down upon me. The steps held human bones. Arm and leg bones placed side by side covered the entire surface of the stairs. Many looked yellowed and cracked with age, but others seemed far fresher, the bones smoother and whiter. The driver's chair was even more horrifying. Hundreds of grinning human skulls composed the guts of the chair, rising up to the ceiling. Human skin covered the front and seat, pale and leathery. Countless human teeth stuck out of the skin, their roots embedded in the supple flesh. The teeth rose up to the top of the bus in crisscrossing diagonal patterns. I glanced back at the driver, seeing his thin body looming over me. One inhumanly long arm pointed at the open door of the bus. It reminded me of the Grim Reaper showing the way forwards to the recently dead. He stood without speaking. His eyes glittered with insanity, and he had a rictus grin plastered across his smooth white face. No, I don't want to, I pleaded. Don't make me get on it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I should never have come out here. The driver stayed as still as a corpse, with a face like a grinning death mask. I saw movement behind him, realizing two tall, faceless humanoids had appeared in bright jumpsuits to board the bus. They came up besides the driver, their blurry heads bowing down to look at me, if indeed they could see it all without eyes. I wasn't sure whether these creatures were just mimicking human gestures and movements or not. Without warning, the two humanoids scuttled forwards, their rail-thin arms reaching out to me. I tried to crawl away, but moments later, I felt them wrap my wrists. Their skin felt burning hot and feverish. They lifted me up. I tried screaming to call for help from my neighbors, but no help would arrive. They pushed me through the door into the fiery red light beyond. In every seat, I saw tall, emaciated people with smooth faces. The skin rippled and distorted when I tried to look at their heads. The two creatures holding me forced me toward the back. There, a boy of about ten or eleven sat, looking terrified and alone. They threw me into the seat, turning and walking away immediately after. From the front of the bus, I heard the door slowly closing with a squeal of rusted joints. The driver was back in his seat. I looked up, seeing him staring into the rearview mirror at me, grinning. How'd you get here? The boy asked in a small, quavering voice. I turned to look at him in wonder. His pale skin heavily contrasted with his dark eyes and black hair. With his high cheekbones, he had a slightly vampiric look. I... I don't know. I was kidnapped. What's going on, kid? Who are these people? Where are they taking us? I whispered, constantly looking up to see if we were being watched. Yet the faceless humanoids stayed still in their seats. Their blurry heads pointed straight ahead, totally frozen and unmoving. Only the driver showed any signs of life as he put the bus in drive and slowly pulled forward. They're taking us to the playpen. They showed it to me in my dreams, he said. I used to see these people looking in my window at night, people without faces who looked really tall and skinny. I told my parents about it, but they thought I was just having nightmares. But when I fell asleep, they showed me everything. Okay, so what is it? What did you see? I asked. His face went pale. He just shook his head. I don't think you really want to know, he answered. Both of us will be there soon enough, and then you'll see for yourself. I found out the boy's name was Ian, and I told him mine was Landon. He said he was from the other end of Frost Hollow, and that he had been on the bus for days without food or water. It circles around to different towns, Ian whispered. I looked out the window, seeing a dark desert all around us. Sand dunes swirled on both sides of an endless highway. I hadn't noticed when the world outside had shifted from forest to desert. Those things without faces? They come in people's houses, get inside their head, and their dreams. They make you think horrible things. 
They used to scream at me that I needed to kill myself, to hang myself or slit my wrists. I call them the Stalkers. That's a good name for them, I said listlessly, still staring out the window at the shadowy endless dunes. We're not getting out of this, are we, Ian? I mean alive. Probably not, he said, his voice hopeless and dead. On the horizon of the dead, dark desert, a black monolith rose high in the air. In general shape, it looked like a lighthouse, but it had no windows, and its outer walls looked like polished obsidian or onyx. It appeared to rise hundreds of stories into the cloudless sky. The bus started slowing down. The crimson lights lit up overhead. I looked forward, realizing that all the stalkers had turned their blurry heads now to stare straight back at me and Ian. The driver, too, continuously looked at us through the rearview mirror as the bus came to a stop. Now arriving, the playpen. A robotic female voice intoned calmly through speakers built into the walls. The door at the front flew open. Except for the idling of the engine, everything had gone deathly silent. I think they want us to get out, Ian whispered nervously, slowly getting to his feet. I wanted to say no, to fight back, but with dozens of faceless stalkers staring at us in their eerie, frozen poses, my courage failed me. On unsteady legs, I got to my feet and followed Ian down the walkway. The faces of the stalkers turned to follow us, seeming to blur and ripple faster with excitement. I wondered what would happen once we got outside, but in reality, I had no inkling of the horrors ahead. As I stepped down onto the inky pavement of the street, I realized that this desert felt freezing cold. Wind swept across the dunes at a tremendous speed. Clouds of dark sand obscured the black sky. The bus door stayed open, all of its passengers watching us with interest. The driver, too, never took his eyes off of me and Ian. I wanted to get far away from these creepy stalkers. Let's go, I said over the roaring winds, putting a hand on Ian's shoulder. He flinched away, looking small and scared. Side by side, we started walking down the road. It wasn't long before we found our first body. A mummified corpse lay on the side of the street, its dried flesh sticking tightly to the bone. Its eyeless sockets stared straight up. Its open mouth looked like it was frozen in a silent scream, a black hole filled with sand. Ian gave a strangled cry as he saw it, falling back. Hey buddy, it's okay, I said. It's just a dead body. He shook his head, pointing vigorously at the desiccated corpse. I followed the line of his finger, realizing something odd was happening. The corpse had begun to shake and rattle, its splayed out limbs jumping up and down. The ragged strands of cloth still covering its chest and legs ripped apart with a soft tearing sound. Wet, black tentacles covered in dozens of eyes rose up, snapping apart the remaining bones and flesh with ease. As the ribs jutted up like spikes, something hellish slithered out. It rolled on its tentacles, a ball of slithering limbs covered in something slick and shiny. Though the size of a small dog as it splayed out, its width and height doubled. It had no head or central mass, but its many eyes constantly blinked in chaotic and random patterns. The eyes looked blue and very human, bloodshot and dilated with fury. Get away from it! Ian screamed with a terror I had never heard in a child's voice before. He ripped at my arm, pulling me back. I stumbled, nearly falling. The tentacled creature slithered towards us at an incredible speed. Its many eyes focused ahead, insane and furious. As we turned, I glimpsed stalkers watching us from the sides of the street. Their blurred faces stayed hidden in the sandstorms blowing past, but I saw their tall, inhuman silhouettes in the darkness. They reminded me of spectators watching gladiators dying in the Colosseum. What is it? I shrieked over the roaring winds. What happens if it catches us? Ian was breathless with terror, sprinting ahead of me. He was a very fast kid. Don't let it catch you, he screamed back. I realized the monolith stood ahead of us only a few hundred feet. A powerful current of hope surged through my heart as I saw a massive threshold filled with white light. But as I got to within a stone's throw away, I felt something warm and slick close around my ankle. I screamed as I fell forward, 
seeing Ian disappearing through the doorway, his silhouette sharp and clear for a moment before the white light swallowed him up like a hungry mouth. God damn it, help me, I cried, crawling towards the white light. I kicked and struggled against the tentacles wrapping around my leg with a grip like squeezing metal bands. I dragged my hands through the sand as I felt myself pulled back, my head smacking hard against the pavement underneath. Stars danced in front of my vision, in the gloom and darkness, swimming against unconsciousness. I glimpsed more of the stalkers, always watching from a far distance, their flesh seeming to ripple with excitement at the prospect of witnessing imminent death and dismemberment. As more tentacles wrapped around my waist, I looked back. Only inches away, furious, dilated eyes stared back. The tendril shot towards my mouth as others held my head in place. I didn't know what it would do once it got inside me, but I knew instinctively it would be something horrible. I heard a hoarse shout, felt something smash into the creature on my chest. I felt the tentacles suddenly retract from my face and head, the eyes turning to look at whatever new threat had arrived. A thin man with a long beard and haunted eyes stood above me, holding a homemade stone club. It looked like it had been whittled from sandstone. The end formed into a jagged point. The tentacled creature hissed like a snake as the man bashed it again. Finally, mercifully, it released me. I rolled away, coughing and sputtering. Run, you idiot! The man cried, smashing the creature through one of its many eyes with the sharp point at the end. The eye exploded in a shower of black blood and vitreous fluid. The creature's hissing escalated into a distorted wail that split and echoed like hundreds of voices screaming at once. I didn't need more encouragement than that. Shell-shocked and terrified, I scrambled to my feet, sprinting the last few steps towards the threshold. I looked back to see the man running behind me, the tentacled creature hissing and gurgling as it pursued. Together, we fell through the doorway of white light. As soon as we crossed the threshold, the creature stopped, its eyes furiously blinking and glaring. A few heartbeats later, it rolled away its silhouette disappearing into the shadowy dunes outside. Well, that star spawn almost got you, the man whispered, clapping me on the shoulder. Good thing I was coming back this way. I went out hunting. He showed me a dead rattlesnake slung around his back. I'm Teddy, by the way. He reached out his hand to me, but I only stared at it. He let it drop after a moment. Star spawn? I asked. He nodded eagerly his brown eyes gleaming. He looked extremely thin and malnourished, and the clothes he wore were frayed and falling apart. I wondered how long he had been trapped here. That's what we call them, yeah, Teddy answered. They come off the Black God. Parts of his body sometimes fall off when he's sleeping. Little parts here and there, but they regrow into... those things. The star spawn. If they get their tentacle down your throat, it's game over, buddy. A little piece of them breaks off and starts growing in your stomach, eating away at your organs and muscle until it decides to break through. It's not a fast death either. You might be in excruciating pain for weeks before it kills you. I looked around the room in the black tower where we stood. A massive chamber with gleaming obsidian walls surrounded us, extending up dozens of feet to a flat black ceiling. There, a bright spotlight pointed down at us, illuminating the room in white light. Stairs made of the same stone spiraled up the outer perimeter of the circular room, disappearing into a gap in the ceiling. My friend came through here, I asked. Do you know where he is? Teddy shook his head. What's your friend's name, stranger? He asked. I laughed uncertainly, then introduced myself. Well, he's got to be upstairs with the other one. The other one? I asked. Teddy nodded. We're not the only refugees here, Landon. He answered. The bus brings more victims all the time from all over the world. A lot of them don't last long. The star spawn often get them, and if they don't, the stalkers hunt them down and torture them to death. I've seen a lot of bodies skinned alive, people who got caught by the stalkers. Well, let's go see them, I said. I want to make sure he's okay. He's just a boy, you know. Teddy looked at me grimly. He's not the only child who's been brought to this place, he answered. I've seen more corpses of children here than you could possibly know. I walked up the stairs with Teddy at my heels, 
rising through the gap in the ceiling. Here, there was an even larger chamber, rising up thousands of feet into the air. Towards the top of it, I saw something massive and black with thousands of tentacles. It stuck to the flat ceiling, slick and wet, the countless enormous eyelids on its limbs tightly closed in sleep. Drops of slime occasionally fell down from the creature's body, landing on the floor with soft patterings. I saw an old woman sitting next to a small fire with Ian by her side. She had a rattlesnake on a spit and was cooking it. Ian had a leather satchel of water in his hands, which he drank from thirstily before passing it back to her. I remember him saying he had been trapped on the bus for days, and I wondered if he had any food or water that whole time. I walked forwards, waving and smiling, feeling much more hopeful seeing Ian alive and well. I glanced nervously up at the tentacled monstrosity, uncertain of whether I should be afraid or not. The black god sleeps above us, the old woman whispered. Do not wake him. We must escape before he awakes, Teddy said furtively, putting a calloused hand on my shoulder. We are going to try to hijack the bus. It is the only way between worlds. If we stay here, we will all certainly die, including the boy. It's only a matter of time. But if we can kill the driver... What about all the stalkers? I asked. It's not just the driver. Whatever is on the bus, the black god is far worse, the man whispered. His sleep becomes more troubled as time passes. We see his tentacles twisting with his nightmares. Once he awakens, those nightmares will spread throughout the playpen. Right now, we are only hunted by the star spawn and the stalkers. I met an old man who saw the black god awaken, the old woman said. When I got here, he was still alive. Every few months, the black god comes alive to feed, and he said that the corpses walk when that happens. The dead scream and the sky rips apart, and everything moving gets hunted down like vermin to be absorbed into the black god's flesh, where they live for weeks being slowly digested and driven insane by the pain. So how did he survive? I asked. She shrugged. He said he hid in the bus. The driver gets out sometimes to hunt, and he snuck in. The black god missed him, but he was the only one. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I found out the old woman's name was Jackie. Like Teddy, she wanted to get out of the playpen immediately. The stalkers and starspawn won't come in here, she said. They're afraid of the black god. And rightly so, Teddy muttered. It's suicidal to be in here. That thing could wake up at any minute and we'll be the first ones sucked into hell if it does. I've heard the screams of people being eaten by the Black God's flesh, and it sounds like they're being burned alive. They went on for weeks, months. Stop it, Jackie insisted. You're scaring the boy. I looked over at Ian, seeing she was right. He looked ready to pass out, his skin turning chalk white. Jackie pulled the roasted rattlesnake off the spit, ripping it apart with her hands and handing pieces of it to Ian and Teddy. She looked at me, her wrinkled face cocked. Do you want a piece? I shook my head, feeling slightly nauseous just looking at the dead, burnt snake. Its head was still attached to the body, its open eyes blackened and staring. So what's the plan here? I asked. How do we get back? Teddy looked at me, chewing a mouthful of rattlesnake. He lifted his homemade sandstone club, then nodded past Jackie. I followed his line of sight, seeing a few more primitive truncheons. That's it? We're going to bludgeon the driver and all the stalkers and steal the bus? Teddy nodded. You have a better idea? He answered. In truth, I did not. The four of us went back out of the stone monolith that held the black god, seeing the endless paved road disappearing into the horizon. Armed with the primitive stone truncheons, we walked side by side, constantly scanning the darkness for enemies. There are bodies everywhere, Teddy said over the roar of the wind. Most of them have starspawn hiding inside. I wondered how often the bus came this way, but at that moment, chaos broke out. I saw the starspawn with one punctured eye rolling furiously down the pavement. I pointed, screaming, when something ran into me from the side. I fell hard into Ian, knocking both of us down. We went sprawling in the sand as two stalkers stood overhead, 
their insane faces blurring and jerking from side to side as arms as long as a human twisted toward me. Sharp fingers jabbed down at my face, and in a blinding moment of absolute panic and agony, I felt them puncture my left eye. I screamed, jerking back as they ripped and crumpled my eye. I felt it explode with a powerful jet of blood and vitreous fluid. My vision went white with agony. At that moment, I saw headlights through the haze of pain and terror. In my shell-shocked state, I barely realized it was the bus speeding down the road. The small star spawn hissed with animal hunger before a tire ran over it, causing black blood to explode from it like a water balloon filled with sludge. Teddy came behind the stalker, bringing his heavy stone club down on the back of its head. I heard a wet crack of bone as it fell limply on top of me, its fingers still clutching my dismembered eye. I realized the optic nerve and blood vessels were still attached, running along a few inches from the mutilated socket. I pushed myself to my feet with a rush of adrenaline, feeling the vessels rip apart like snapping string. I nearly passed out, but Ian and Teddy came to my sides, each putting a steadying hand around my back. The bus stopped in front of us, the door shrieking open. As the first of the stalkers descended the step, I heard a primal screaming from behind us, from the direction of the monolith. I looked back in terror, seeing the top of it explode in a shower of volcanic stone as massive tentacles hundreds of feet long reached blindly out. The black god pulled itself up, like a colossus sitting atop the world. Its many gigantic eyes glared down balefully. It's starting, Teddy screamed. We need to get on that bus now. Staggering, I watched the three of them run forwards. I followed behind, feeling weak and sick. With my one remaining eye, I saw the driver descending the stairs. His black eyes bulged as he stared up at the sky. I realized with horror that the clouds had started to rain fire. The flickering flames lit up the world as the black god roared with a primal scream. Teddy ran forward, raising the club to strike at the driver. Casually, almost lazily, the driver raised one hand, grabbing Teddy by the neck and lifting him off the ground. His sharp fingers stabbed into the skin and flesh, digging deeply as Teddy gurgled. He weakly brought the club down as the driver threw his broken body to the side of the road. Teddy twitched, suffocating on his own blood, and seizing. I watched his eyes roll back in his head. Jackie and Ian ran at the driver together, closing in on him from both sides. Ian struck at the long, emaciated leg under the black suit. The driver slashed at Jackie's face as bone cracked under the weight of Ian's blow. The driver buckled as his leg gave way, his furious, lidless eyes ratcheting towards Ian. As he fell, he reached forward, dragging the boy down with him. I saw Jackie on the ground next to them with deep stab wounds eating through her eyes and into her brain. Blood spurted from her still body. I stumbled forward, raising the club and bringing it down on the back of the driver's head. His head collapsed as he clawed and stabbed at Ian's face and neck, opening up his throat in an instant. I heard gurgling and weak cries as I jumped onto the bus. Sickened by all the blood and death, I ran up the steps, never looking back. Bleeding heavily, my vision turning white with pain, I started the bus. The engine turned on immediately, rumbling and powerful. I had never heard such a sweet sound in all my life. I began driving ahead, down the freezing dark streets of the playpen. I felt my hands sticking to the steering wheel, my skin covered in gore and clotted blood. I glanced in the rearview mirror and had to repress an urge to scream. Every seat was filled with stalkers, their blurring faces looking straight ahead. Their long, mannequin-like bodies twisted and jerked. Like one single hive mind, they rose. Up ahead, the dark street disappeared into a spiraling vortex the color of fresh blood. I accelerated, pushing the bus as fast as it would go. Afraid to look back, to see what the stalkers would do, I drove through the vortex, pushing the bus up to 70 and 80 miles an hour. The blinding torrents of crimson light dissolved to reveal my street, Slaughterhouse Road. I slammed on the brakes, glancing back to see a stalker only inches behind me, its twisted fingers reaching out to grab me. Their heads jerked from side to side, blurring and jumping. Their arms seemed to vibrate with seizure-like movements. 
I heard a cry like one voice, a sound of anticipation and bloodlust. I opened the door and fell out of the bus as sharp fingers clawed at my head and scalp. Fresh blood ran down my face as I crawled across the pavement, screaming and crying. Thankfully, one of my neighbors heard me and came out, shining a flashlight in my bloody, mutilated face. Soon after, I lost consciousness. I remember waking up in the hospital, but my nightmares were always of Playpen and the Black God. And I think they always will be. That's a wrap for today on The Midnight Mystery. Hope you guys had as much fun as we did. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. Oh, and don't be shy. Drop a comment below with your thoughts or any cool mystery ideas you want us to check out. Until next time, we'll see you in the next Midnight Mystery.